Good morning, New Life. How's everybody doing this morning? Y'all look pretty. Y'all sound wide awake this morning. I like it. So uh, before we start this morning, I want to kind of lay something out there that God has laid on my heart. It's actually been pressing on me for a, a couple of weeks now. And about two Sundays, I felt like God wanted me to say something, but I didn't. So he revisited me this morning with the same two words, which to me is, uh, I don't think it's coincidental because Miss Lori kind of hit on it last Sunday. Um, I feel like God's calling us. Not necessarily a challenge is what I would say, but when I pray to him and I'm asking him, what do you want me to do? The first two words that come to me are first works. And then I've been feeling kind of, you know, up here, maybe I could do things better. In my life, maybe I could do things better. And I think about how things, how I used to do them when I first started loving Jesus, when I first came to Jesus, and how I was excited and I've kind of let that drop down. So I don't know who, knew who else needed to hear that this morning, but I think God is calling all of us to return to our first works. Amen. So, But if you're not already standing this morning, I invite you to stand and worship. Since when oh, ever This is the sound of tribals rattling. This is the place make a dead man walk again. Open the grave, I'm coming out. I'm gonna live, gonna live again. Open the grave, I'm coming out. I'm gonna live, gonna live again. 
Open the grave, I'm coming out I'm gonna live, gonna live again This is the sound of dry bones rattling Good morning How's everybody doing? You see that little jog right there? Do you, and this plays perfectly, not plays, this runs perfectly into what I felt like I needed to say. Do you feel like you've been running? And I, this is not a joke. I was going to say that. Do you feel like you've been running? Like, now i got to catch my breath. Because I was actually running. There's, there's uh, Psalm 60... Psalm 62.5. I'm going to pull it up. Now this is um, David waiting on the Lord. This is him going through trials. But resting and waiting is good uh, for us when we're out of focus on priorities too. 62.5, 62.5, my soul, Psalm 62.5, my soul waits silently, silently for God, for my hope is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my refuge. I will not be moved. And God is my salvation and my glory. The rock of my strength and my shelter is in God. Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a shelter for us. Selah. Think about that. That's what Selah is. Think about that. He is our shelter. He is everything that we need. When we're running through life, when we feel like we just can't hold it all together, when we've got a million things going on and our mind is here, and we've got to switch gears and go here, and we've got to change and do this, and just rest. Rest in Him. This moment right here, everything that's out there can wait. Everything that is, is bothering you out there or, or taking up part of your mind out there, it can wait. The bills, they'll be there when you get back out there. Or they won't. And it's a blessing, right? The, uh, ev- everything that is, is a distraction, let it wait and rest on him. Rest in his word. Praise him. And just let him be God. Let's put our focus back on him and just see what he does, right? All right. Lo, we in this house, you know, if you've been here before, we do everything in prayer. We cover everything in prayer. This is a praying house. And we invite you, if you're, if you're a guest with us today, we invite you to pray with us out loud. If you don't feel comfortable, perfectly fine. But that's our invitation to you. Let's pray. Father God, first, I thank you. I thank you for who you are. I thank you for your glory. I thank you for your holiness, God. I thank you for for everything that you do for us and, and the ways that you make for us, even before we realize you're doing it. God, I pray. I, I praise you. I praise your name, the name above all names, Jesus. Lord, I pray that you just have your way in this place today. I pray that you move us out of the way. God, I pray that the Holy Spirit moves and just wrecks us, change mindsets. Lord, I I pray that miracles happen, whether it's in the mind, the soul, or the the, uh, physical body. Lord, you work the miracles. You decide what you want to do today. You don't need our permission, Lord, but we invite you. We invite you into this place. Lord, we are desiring to be not not just to see your hand for the gifts, but to see your hand, your face for your presence. God, we want you. We know that we'll be changed in your presence, but Lord, what we want is you. We want to know you. We want to uh, uh, feel your presence, God. Make your way known to us. Lord, use us in this, this place today. Use us in, uh, use this congregation for this community, Lord. Change change everything that you want to change anything that's not of you lord but today we just ask you to have your way thank you god in jesus name amen
see the King of glory coming on the clouds with fire. The whole earth shakes. The whole earth shakes. I see His love and mercy. Washing over all our sin, the people sing, the people sing. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. Selfless faith. I see a near revival stirring as we pray and see. We're on our knees. We're on our knees. Jose. Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. So hear my make it clean open up my eyes to the things I see show me how to love like you have loved me and break my heart for a prayer and everything I am for your kingdom's cause as I walk from earth into eternity Hosanna 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 in the highest Hosanna 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 in the highest Hosanna in the highest Hosanna So hear my heart and make it clean. Open up my eyes to the things unseen. Show me how to love like you have loved me. My heart for breaks yours. And everything I am for your kingdom's cause. As I walk through. 
from earth into eternity. Just the voices. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the Surrender. 
This is my surrender. Here is where I lay it down. You are all I'm chasing now. This is my surrender. This is my surrender. And I will make room. up the crown of all my tradition break down the walls of all my religion your way is better your way is better shake up the crown of all my tradition break down the walls of all my religion your way is better your way is better Shake up the ground of all my tradition. Break down the walls of all my religion. Your way is better. Your way is better. And I will make room for you to do whatever you want to. To do whatever you want to. And I will make room for you to do whatever you want to, to do whatever you want to. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, There is freedom when the Spirit of the Lord is. There is freedom and lift your eyes to heaven. your eyes to heaven, there is freedom, freedom reigns in this place, showers of mercy and grace. Just 
give you all to Jesus. Jesus reigns in this place. Showers of mercy and grace. Calling on every place. There is Jesus reigns in this place. Showers of mercy and grace. Falling on every face. There is freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Lift your eyes to heaven, there is freedom. Lift your eyes to heaven, there is Jesus reigns in this place, showers of mercy and grace, falling on every face, there is freedom, Jesus reigns in Showers of mercy and grace Falling on every face There is freedom Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. We worship you, Lord. We bless you, Jesus. We magnify you, Lord. You're worthy to be praised. Hallelujah, 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 Jesus. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. You know, Jesus said, I've come that you may have life and that you have it to the full. One of the things I've noticed in this current culture and situation that we find ourselves in is that many people claim that they're free. They have all types of freedoms but they're not free and they're not alive they're not they're not living life they're slave to an ideology they're slave to sin they're slave to their own self promotion they're slave to whatever it is that they find themselves encaptured by 
and imprisoned by, but they are not enjoying true freedom. They don't have joy in their heart. And, and, and consequently, they don't have joy in their life. Because I see a lot of people that say that they're joyful and that they're free, but their life is not happy. And listen, happy and joyful are not the same. I get that. But if I have the joy of the Lord as my strength, if, if I'm free and free indeed, I'm going to be more happy than I am frustrated. I'm going to be more happy than I am sad or mad or aggravated. Amen? I've come, he said, that you might have life. And that you have it to its full. That's your joy. He said, I want to give you joy, and I want your joy to be full. And in this song that we've been singing, he said, If the Lord has made you free, then you are free indeed. Amen? Free. You're not in bondage to anything. Free. I just feel like a lot of us today are in bondage to whatever. I don't, I don't know exactly what it is. You know, maybe it's your own expectations. Maybe it's somebody else's expectations. Maybe it's something you feel like you have to live up to or somebody you have to be or somebody you're trying not to be. But I encourage you today to surrender your heart and your life to God. And if you have already surrendered your heart and your life to God, then I encourage you today to live as the free. And remind yourself that he whom the Son has set free is free indeed. And stop being in, in, entangled by all of this stuff. Stop trying to live up to these mindsets and these pressures and these expectations and all this stuff that you put on yourself and others outside of you put on you and you only have to live up to the expectation of Christ. And His expectation is this. You live surrendered to me. If you live surrendered to Him, I promise you, you'll meet every expectation He has for you. And you say, well, I can't be holy. I can't be good. I can't. You don't have to be all that stuff. All you have to do is be in Him. And he'll make you that stuff. He said, we talked about this this morning. He said, I, I, I'm your God. And you'll be holy because I'm holy. A lot of people look at that as a commandment. And it is, mind you. But it's first and foremost a statement. He said, I'm your God. And I'm going to be in you. And I'm going to be with you. And because I'm in you and I'm with you, I'm holy. And that makes you holy. Holy means set apart. The basic definition of holy is set apart. So stop trying to do it. Stop trying to work so hard to be whatever you think you're supposed to be. And just be surrendered in Him. And live free. Amen? I don't know who I'm talking to today. I'm talking to somebody. I, I, and I, I know I'm talking to a whole group of people. That, I don't mean that. But what I'm saying is, somebody, you need to receive this. You don't just need to hear it. You need to get it deep down into your craw, into the very fiber of who you are, and let it change you. Let it change your thinking. Let it change your mind. This is how you are renewed. Right? Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Paul writes to the Romans and he says, I'm begging you, brothers. I'm just going to paraphrase this, all right? I'm begging you, brothers and sisters, look, to live your life by giving yourself to God as a sacrifice. And that's holy and acceptable to Him. Because it's the least that you can do after what He's done. Is, are you okay with this so far? And He said, I want you to be transformed from this world. You don't be a part of this world. You're transformed from this world. Not because you're taken out of this world. You're still here. 
But remember later on in the Bible, he, or, or in another place, it says that you're in this world, but you're not of this world. So you can't think like this world. You can't act like this world. You can't behave like this world. You can't expect things like this world expects things. Does that make sense? But he said, how do you get out of that way of thinking? How do you get out of that way of living? How do you get out of those chains that seem to constantly bind you up where you keep spinning your wheels over and over and over again? Here's what he said. Renew your mind. Renew your mind. So what does that mean, renew your mind? Here's what it means. You start thinking like I think. And how do you know how God thinks? You listen to what he says. What has he said? He says it in his word. He says it through the spirit of God. He says it through preaching. He says it through songs. He says it through prayer. He speaks to you. He shows you. He helps you. Nobody can define you but God. Amen? Amen? Change your mind. Change your mind. Really, if you want to know the essence of repentance, that's, that's the essence of repentance. Change your mind. Because if you change your mind, you'll change your life. Right? Now, that sounds like a good motivational point, right? Ooh, where did he get that from? Simple from the Bible. As a man thinks, and ladies, that means you too. As you think, that's how you are. Right? Well, I don't believe that. Well, it's too bad if you believe it or not. It, it doesn't matter if you believe it. That's what the Bible says. So that makes it real. Right? You can sit here and say, I'm not here, I'm not here, I'm not here. Guess what? You're still here. And wherever you are, that's where you'll be. That's deep right there. Change your mind. Start believing what God says about you. Quit believing the lies of the devil. Some of you still believe in all these labels and all these things that he put on you and all the stuff you've did in the past or the things you may struggle with over and over. Can I tell you, you are not what you do. You are who he says you are. And if you keep submitting yourself to him and help him let him help you change your mind eventually you'll do who he says you are does that make sense see the devil calls you by your sin but God calls you by your name and he says you're my child you are a son or daughter of the most high God you are a king's kid you are more than a conqueror you hear me you a devil stomping powerhouse full of the spirit and the power of God. That's who you are. Some of you starting to get it. Some of you going to hit you on the way home. You going to think it's the tacos, but it's not. It's God. You just need to just 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 settle with the fact that you're his and that's who you are amen you're not how you feel praise God you're not how you look I'm saying that for me not you because you're a whole lot prettier than I am in fact I hope you feel as good as you look amen that was a good place for you to say amen I'm trying to help y'all out this morning Believe what God said about you. Let me, let me give you a challenge. Can I do that? Would you hand me that, brother? Let me give you a challenge before I get to, in, into, the, into some other stuff. Here's what I want you to do. I want you, if you've been struggling with who you are in Christ, if you've been struggling with feeling unworthy, feeling like you're a failure, 
feeling like you keep doing the same old mess over and over and God's disappointed in you, God's frustrated in you, God's aggravated in you. Listen, I, I just want to help you with something real quick. Can I just, before I give you the assignment, can I do this real quick? There's no way for you to disappoint God. There is absolutely no way for you to disappoint God. For you to disappoint God means that God expects you to be something that you're not. He expects you to be you. He knows who you are, and He knows your strengths, He knows your weaknesses, and He's helping you with all this stuff. So get over the fact that you let God down. You ain't holding Him up, and you can't let Him down. He's not dependent upon what you do or don't do. His emotions and feelings don't get hurt because you made a mistake. But if you've been struggling with that stuff, or you've been struggling with who you are, or what you're supposed to do, and you know what God thinks about you, here's what I want you to do. I want you to get in the book of Psalm. And I want you to start with Psalm 1, and you just start working through there every day, just a little bit at a time. And everywhere the Bible talks about somebody, if it says you, if it says man, if it says a man's name, if it says people of God, if it says Israel, God's chosen, anytime it talks about a human being, you put your name in it. Does that make sense? And I want you to start writing down the promises that God says about you. Because the Bible says this, God is no respecter of person. Here's what that means to you and me. That means what God has thought and said about one person, He thinks and says it about every single one of us. His intentions, His love, His promises are for every single one. Now, He might use somebody. He may never use you to slay Goliath, and you'd probably be happy about that. But that doesn't mean you can't be a giant killer if God intends for you to be. You understand what I'm saying? He may not lead, he may not use you to lead people out of captive and, and captivity and bondage, but that doesn't mean that God hasn't made you a conqueror. So write it down and write what God says. Write down the promises of what he says. And you start believing what God says about you. And live free. Stop living trapped by your mind and other people's expectations and the devil's lies. Amen. The Bible says this. It doesn't say it in these words, but here's the true meaning. Your heart, your life, your spirit man, your essence, whatever you, however you want to look at it, you are now the temple of the living God. That means that in you is now God's holy of holies. That's where the Spirit of God resides. <laughs> Are you understanding me? Everything about you's changed if you belong to Christ. I always say it like this. I know I'm not super smart, but I know the difference between old and new. Anybody know the difference between old and new? If somebody says, here, I got you a new pair of shoes, and you look at them, and they're all scuffed up and muddy, is that new? It might be new to you, but that's not new. Right? New. New. It's what Jesus said. If you're in Christ, you are what? A new creation. Old things, former things, the past is gone. All things. Everybody say all things. Can you say it one more time? All things. Now what does all mean? All means some. Does all mean everything but one or two? Everything but the stuff you can let go of? Does all mean everything but the stuff you, you think you've forgiven yourself of? Or, or that one thing your mama still holds against you? No. All means all. All things have been made new. New. Somebody say new. New. You are a new creation in Him. Amen. Can you give Him praise?
That's all right. Some of y'all just patty caking a little bit, but I'll take it. I'll take it. Listen, quick announcements. Our young people, I want you guys to go ahead and start lining up. Get Be dismissed. Quick announcement. Um, the uh, sign-up sheet for the men's fellowship meeting, which is not tomorrow, but next Monday, um, which will be the Monday after tomorrow, the, the next Monday after tomorrow. Right? Some of y'all get confused about that. Next Monday is not tomorrow, even though it's the next Monday. It's next Monday. It's the first, sun, uh, first Monday in October. All right, 6.30 p.m., the menu sign-up sheet is out here in the foyer on the desk. And so, men, if you'll go by and uh, sign up so we'll know you're coming and maybe sign up to bring something, um, it's, it's going to be great. If, if you're new to us, we would invite you to come out and be a part and uh, enjoy a good meal and time of fellowship. And we have um, just discussion and we do some Bible study. We have fun. We pray. We, we, just, we, we, we eat. Did I say we eat? We eat. We like eating. Do y'all like eating? Some of y'all like eating. I can tell. Don't act like you don't. What did Kelly do is what I want to know. <laughs> the kids got up and left, and I just looked over here all of a sudden, and you just right. I said, what did Kelly do? Is, it, is she mad? Is y'all mad? She's the only one over there. That must be where the air blows well. That's right there. Just right right there. Okay. The church is going to tip over this way. That's all right. Thank you for being over there, Kelly. Gives me a reason to look this way. <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, also, ladies, um, your meeting is the following Monday, second Monday of the month, same deal. You'll have a, a sign-up sheet and a menu out there, and we invite you to come and be a part. It, it, if, if you are a member or if you just a, you know, if you're a guest, ho whoever, if you do, if you want a time of fellowship, come. Bring somebody with you, and and uh, you'll be blessed. Amen? Amen. You'll be blessed. It'll be a good too. I don't I don't I don't know what they're eating. But it probably won't be as good as ours, but uh, you know, it. Huh? Fall festival sign up is out there as well. And I'm not sure how that's working because somebody else is handling it. Praise God. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come and have a good time. So there's stuff out there to sign up to do, stuff out there to sign up to bring, and, and we'll have food and fun. What day is that? 27th. 27th of October. Friday night, right? I don't know. I'm just, hey, I just do what they tell me to do. So anyhow, 27th of, of October, Friday night, we're going to have our fall festival. So come make plans to be a part. Invite somebody to come be a part of that too. Amen? Amen. Y'all are all being awful quiet. Um, so y'all going to have to get involved. Y'all going to have to start getting a little more. Because if you don't, I promise you, I'm just going to preach until you get busy. So it's up to you how long you stay today. You can. But I ain't going to stop. Thank you, bro. Somebody needs a somebody need to give him a left foot of fellowship. <laughs> Y'all, if, if you're a guest with us, we just we just relaxed around here, so don't think we're crazy. He's not he's not crazy, by the way. Well, maybe a little bit, but he's a good guy. <laughs> hey, um, if we have a uh, special thing this morning, we're going to receive some members today. So if you are, uh, if you are making a uh, covenant relationship with the church this morning and membership, I want you to come. Just come right up front, if you will. I know, right? And so just come right here in the front. Um, and so uh, Russ and Faye and Judy are uh, are joining with us today. Now Judy actually is coming to us by way of joining by membership transfer um, if we can if we can actually get it. Sometimes we can't, sometimes we can't, but she's she's officially joining today. She was a member. She's been here a long time actually. I say a long time, but they've been here a good while. Um, almost 2 years. Um, but they're member she has membership with the Church of God in Ohio. Is that right? Yeah. In Ohio. Kansas, Ohio, if that's crazy enough. 
I don't know if that's a city or a state, but <laughs> it's a spot in the road, she said. I, hey, I know those places. Cincinnati, right outside. Oh, I was known for that, right? There's a place I took a kid home when we were at the home for children. I took a, we had to move a child. Me and Ken Addis put him in the van, all this stuff, and took him home. His parents couldn't come and get him. And uh, we drove from Cleveland, uh, well, from uh, Sevierville, Tennessee, to, I don't know, some spot outside of Cincinnati, Ohio. And it wasn't really a spot. I remember Ken saying, well, the funniest things I've ever heard anybody say in my life, he's just like, we were just driving down the road. All of a sudden, it was like a dirt road. And trees everywhere. And the kid goes, turn right here. We were like, where? He said, right here. And he's like, there's not a road. He said, yeah, there is, I promise. And it was like, you turn and you thought you was going to run into a bunch of bushes. And you go through the bushes, all of a sudden it opens up. There's another dirt road. It was like a secret layer behind there. You know what I'm saying? He goes, just drop me off at the phone booth. And we were like, the phone booth? So we get down there, and it wasn't a phone booth, y'all. Some of y'all don't even know what I'm talking about when I say phone booth because y'all, y'all ain't seen a pay phone. You know what I'm saying? But it wasn't even a phone booth. It was a pole with a pay phone on it. You know what I'm saying? And it was just right there. So we wound up taking him to his house, and he lived back in the middle of nowhere. I mean nowhere, nowhere. And Ken said, Ken said nobody really intended to move here, so the wheel fell off of somebody's wagon, and they just were forced to stay. You know, it became a spot. So that's, that's kind of where you are. Kansas, Ohio. Never heard of it. But watch and see. It'll come up some kind of way. Anyhow, I'm excited for you guys to, to be uh, making fellowship and part of, uh, of New Life, the body. And, and, and they've all been here for a little while. And, and if you're here and you're interested in becoming a, a member in, in covenant relationship with us through membership, we don't force you to. We don't actually require you to to be a part of new life. But there's certain things that that doors that it opens for you and coverings that it gives for you, and it's a good thing to do. Um, just in your time and in God's time, we'll be offering another membership class soon. Be praying about that, and and you can do that. Just let us know if you're if you're interested. And uh, also, um, I don't think we have a date scheduled yet, but coming up very soon, we're going to have a day for baptism because we have a couple that's interested in that. And if you are interested in being baptized, uh, please let me or Pastor Lori know, um, or maybe one of your leaders, if you're in a youth group or kids or college, um, just let, let your leader know and we'll get that, we'll get that done. We're going to have that very soon. Um, but we're doing this membership today, and all these have been through the process in the class, and we've asked them all the pertinent questions. And the only thing I need to do right now is just ask you, um, because we are required to do this um, by the minutes of the General Assembly, uh, is to ask you if anybody has any legal objection, any reason why these cannot partner with our church in membership. I didn't think there would be. All right, so it's, uh, it's our pleasure uh, to welcome you to be a member and uh, in covenant relationship with this body, with New Life. And I would like for you to stretch your hands this way, if you will. Lori, would you join me here? And uh, I want to have prayer over them. Come on in just a little bit, Judy. And uh, we're just going to pray with them. And uh, you just pray with us. Amen. Father, we thank you, Lord God, for how you lead and guide us in our lives, Lord, and that your, our steps are ordered by you. And Lord, we are thankful for New Life, for this body that you've given us to be belong to and to be a part of, Lord God. And uh, we know that there are many, many, many good churches around this area and and uh, in your kingdom, Lord God, and we're thankful that you've led these to us, Lord God. And, and we, we covenant with them, Lord God, to, to serve them and to love them and to be here for them as pastors, Lord God, and as, as brothers and sisters in the kingdom. And God, we, we look forward to what you're going to do in their lives and what you're going to do in our lives through them and the gifts and the talents that they have to offer to us and, uh, and, and, and how we're going to grow together. We thank you, Lord God, for your goodness, for your faithfulness, for your love and your mercy and your grace. I pray you would put favor in their life, that you would open up doors for them in so many wonderful ways. Grow them, God, into the man and the women that you, would, that you have designed for them to be. And we are thankful and grateful. We give you glory and honor and praise in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Everybody say amen. Can you give the Lord a hand of praise? God is good, amen? So welcome to you ladies and gentlemen, gentleman, and he is a gentleman by the way. So all right, you ready for the word of God? Say amen. amen. 
All right, so I've been in this little mini series, um, this little impromptu mini series, um, and, and and Lord willing, I'll start a series next week. I don't know why I keep saying that, but we'll see what happens. Um, but we are we were talking about with the last two weeks we talked about faith and hope, and uh, and so this week we're going to finish that off because the Bible says these three remain: faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is what. Love. So we're going to talk today about love. Everybody say love. love. We're going to talk today about love. And, and see, here's the thing. The reason that, that, that the Bible says that the greatest of these is love is because several reasons. I'm just going to pull a couple out of the Word. Number one, the Bible says God is love. And if we belong to God and He's in Him, then we must display love in our lives. I think it's kind of counterproductive, not kind of counterproductive, it is counterproductive. It is, is an absolute, I want to say oxymoron, but I believe it's even stronger than that. It is a contradiction in terms and reality for a Christian to walk and not be in love. If you claim to be a Christian and you are not displaying love in your life, there's something wrong in your heart. I'm for real. How many of you know that brother or sister? Yeah? How many of you related to some of them? Whoo, that's rough, right? I've, I've known that brother and sister. They, they, they know God. They know everything about God. They can quote the Bible back and forth, but they don't have love nowhere in their heart. They mean and hateful and spiteful, right? Y'all know what I'm talking about. Hopefully you're not that person. Hopefully when somebody shook their head about knowing that brother or sister, they weren't thinking about you. If they are, you need to do something different. You need to give your heart to Jesus. You need to let God take over. Break up that hardness and that fallow ground of your heart because it is an absolute contradiction for a Christian to not walk in love. Here's another reason why the greatest of these is love because Jesus said it's not miracles, it's not prayer, even though we, we, we love prayer around here. D Dustin talked about that. B God said, my house shall be called a house of prayer. But it's not prayer, it's not miracles, it's not fasting, it's not songs, it's not preaching, it's not teaching, it's not anything you can do that's going to make you known as a follower of Christ. More importantly than it is love. Because this is what Jesus told his disciples. You love each other. And he said, by loving each other, this world's going to know that you belong to me. Not how good you live. Not whether you cuss or not. Not whether you drink or not. Not whether you smoke or not or dip or not or chase women that do. Right? Right? It's right. <laughs> Don't matter how long or short your hair is, whether or not you got on ear bobs. I'm just being old-fashioned for some of y'all. Young people, that means earrings. Whether you wear makeup or not, you know, all the stuff that over time we've said is good and holy, right? Short pants or no short pants. Dress or no dress. Short sleeve, long sleeve. Hair, no hair. Beard, no beard, right? We get caught up in all this stuff. It ain't all that that tells you belong to God. Jesus said it's all about your heart. Do you love people? And that's why the world is confused a lot of times. Because we claim to be Christians and we claim to be the love of Christ and we came, claim to know Him and, and His fullness and we ain't loving nobody. And we're hateful and judgmental and we're ugly and frustrated and being frustrated all the time. And so that's why I like to repeat what my brother Johan, who was here just a little while ago, said to us. Listen, if you have the joy of the Lord, share it with your face. And then share it with somebody else. Smile a little bit, right? You ever know somebody, you're just afraid to ask them how they're doing? You just want to say everything but how you're doing. Hey, good to see you. Bless you with... 
<laughs> you look so good. We want to know how you're doing. It's the truth. I mean, I'm being a little comical about it, but it's the truth, isn't it? And God said this in His Word. I'm going to read a scripture to you. You may not, you may not think that this is a scripture to set up the sermon for love. But I'm going to read this, and, and I want you to understand because I want to put it in our present day context. Now, if you don't understand that we're living in last days. Now, let me just define last days to you. The last days started when Jesus ascended on, into the heavens. And it's been ever since then. So I'll tell you this. I don't know when Jesus is coming back, but we are closer now than we ever have been. And if he waits and we still have tomorrow, we'll be closer tomorrow than we are today. But if you look around, I'm not sure how many prophecies need to get fulfilled and be in things we need to see to realize God's coming soon. Now, soon to Jesus may be 100 years. I don't know. Because the Bible says to him a day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as a day. Now that doesn't mean a formula. That doesn't mean you can go in and figure out, okay, seven days means 7,000 years. And so we got all that. No, what that means is time is irrelevant to God. Because he's outside of time and space. Time and space is for us. But we live in a day and a time that the Bible talked about. And it called it the last days. So I want to read to you from 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. And we're going to talk about love. It says, but mark this, or realize this. There will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, but uh, treacherous, cheaters, and rash. That means that they are lovers of pleasure. They are reckless and conceited. And then it says this, they love pleasure, pleasure rather than loving God. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Now, if you would have asked this question to your parents, they would have said, yep, that's the time we live in. If you asked this question to your grandparents, they would say, yep, that's the time we live in, right? Because all the times seem evil when we compare it to God. But here's the truth. We are living in days and times right now that have not been seen in our world. And things going on that really make us shake our heads and go, what in the world are people thinking? It's the truth. I, I read a story recently about a rabbi who came across a young man. And this is going to be a weird story, but I want you to understand the point of the story, okay? The rabbi came across this young man who was enjoying a nice meal. And the young man had caught a fish, and he had prepared it, and he was eating it. And the rabbi said to the young man, Why are you eating that fish? And he replied, because I love fish. So to that, the rabbi says, Oh, you love fish? So you took the fish out of the water, you killed it, you cooked it, and now you're eating it. But you love fish? And the young man said, But it tastes good. But he said, That's not love. He said, that's not you loving fish. That's the love of fish. Does that make sense to you? Now, that's a weird illustration in a lot of ways. But I want, you to help, I want to help you understand that we throw this word love around so much that we have convoluted it so much that we don't understand what it really means. So we're going to talk about love. Love is a word that our culture 
And our world doesn't understand its meaning. You believe that? It's the truth. In fact, we've labeled so many things love. People call everything love. And we've redefined love in so many ways. And gosh almighty, I promise you, I could go about 45,000 directions right now and preach for 175 minutes and wouldn't even get started. But I'm not going to do that. I'm not focusing on culture. I'm focusing on what love is today. But we say things like, I love my cat. I love this food. I love my kids. I love God. I love this car. I love this shampoo. I love this hairspray. I love these shoes. Right? We don't even think about it. We throw it out there so fast that we don't even think about what love really means. And I understand the expression and the thought we're trying to convey here. But listen, the Apostle Paul was spot on when he wrote that there would be a time when people would be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, and people without love. In fact, that word, without love, can I just explain to you? I said I wasn't going to get in culture, but i got to just bring this into a context so we understand that. If you study the original of that, what it, nat what it actually means is people without natural love. That means that they either love without love or they love without natural love. They love unnaturally in a way that God didn't design love. Then he says they don't love good, but they love pleasure. And they love all this more than they love God. And can I tell you that Paul was not just talking about sinners. you got to remember, Paul wrote this to the church. We see this in the church. We don't have to worry about people out there. Because we see it in here. Right? You can say amen or oh me, but it's true. And you know what? Behind all the happy selfies and the social media posts are people that are full of disappointment and hurt and pain and disgust and tears and agony, treachery and tragedy. Treachery, sorry, and tragedy. Or treachery, it could be a new word. I'm known for creating some. People talk about so-called love so much. They've watched it and seen it in movies. They've imagined all this stuff. Or people have been so burned on it because it hasn't been present around them so often. Or they've been betrayed by people who say they love them. They don't even believe that real love is possible anymore. I've told you before that the divorce rate is the same in the church as it is outside the church. I've heard people say, I, I just fell out of love with them. From my understanding, let me, let me just tell you this. It's impossible for you to fall out of love. You don't fall out of love. You just fall in love with something else or someone else. And that's what happens when you quit serving God. That's what happens when your heart is drug away from God. That's what happens when your heart becomes to get cold against all the things that you used to know were good and lovely and pleasant and just and right and faithful. And you start finding yourselves going back to the same old things like the Bible says, like a dog returns to its vomit. And then you start thinking all this stuff is good. What used to be bad is now good. The Bible calls that reprobate, by the way. What used to be good is bad, and what used to be bad is good, and right is wrong. It's flipped upside down is what it means. But it's not that you fell out of love. It's that you just started loving something else. 
And how do you love something? How do you fall in love anyways? Do you believe in love at first sight? Love at first sight is, is, is not real. Now, I believe you could see somebody and be so captured by them or so attracted to them or even know because even God told you that's the man or the woman you're going to marry that you realize, boom, that's the one. But that's not love. That's a lot of things, but it's not love. Love is developed by spending time, by developing a relationship, by giving and surrendering and receiving. So what is true love? Let's take a look at this. i got four things I want to show you, and i got a lot of Scripture here, so I want to, I want to move through this kind of quickly. Here's number one, and, and it should be in our, in our app. Is it there? Are you all in the app? Is it there? So if you, if you have the uh, Version Bible app, if you go into the events, you'll see our, 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 our event there, and you can follow along if you, if you do that electronically. The rest of you is going to be up here behind me. Here's what the first thing we need to understand is God is true love. If you want to know what true love is, if you want to know what love is at its very essence, it's God. 1 John 4, 7 and 8. Beloved, let us love one another for this, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. And you thought I was joking a minute ago when you said, when I said it was a contradiction in terms and behavior to say that you're a Christian and not have love in your heart. But the Bible says it's not even just a contradiction, but it says if you don't love, you don't know God. And people get offended at preachers that say stuff like that. I can't believe he said that to me. Listen, the Bible said it to you. I'm just telling you what God said. If you don't love, you don't know God. So love's important, isn't it? And I'm going to tell you something else. If you want to love and you want to be loved, it behooves you to know God and to understand who God is. Outside of the knowledge of God, no one can understand what true love is. Now, you can love your children. You can love your grandbabies. I've been watching this lady back here, but I'm assuming that's a baby right there. Yep, right? Either that or you're doing a really good job faking it. Is that a grandbaby? Baby? Foster baby. All right. But I've been watching you just love on that baby and, and, and hold that baby and pull it close. That's love. But listen, even that love falls short of true love that we understand from God. And here's the thing, without God, outside of God, we really don't understand what love is. Love is not something that God does. Love is not something that God has. And love is not just something that God gives. Love is God. And God is love. Here's the second thing you need to understand. God loves you individually. Now I know, and I'll use this scripture in a little bit. John 3.16. Everybody knows John 3.16, right? If you don't know it, you've heard it. For God so loved the world. That means God loves everybody, right? I told you a little while ago, God is no respecter of person. And he does love everybody and he gave his only son for everybody. That whoever, everybody say whoever. Who is whoever? Whoever. That's everybody, right? But I want you to know that God loves you individually. And I read my Bible, and I'm going to tell you what I firmly believe with all my heart, and I believe it's backed up by the promises and the Word of God. If you were the only person that needed saving, Jesus Christ would have still went to the cross just for you. He loves you individually. 
Psalm 139, verse 15 through 17 says this, You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, and I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. How precious are your thoughts about me, O God. They cannot be numbered. In another place in, the, in Psalm, it says that the thoughts of God about you are more than there are grains of sand on this earth. Can you imagine that? Now, I've used this example before over the years, but I want to just break this down for those of you who may not have heard that before. Listen to me. When the Bible says, your thoughts are more than the sand of the earth. So you take every beach on this planet... Every golf course, because they all have sand traps on them. Every yard in Florida, because even if it has grass, it's still just sand. Every desert, as deep as it can be. And then guess what? There's more sand than that. The ocean is covered, the ocean covers three-fourths of this planet. Did you know that? And guess what's on the bottom of the ocean? Sand. Now, if you were to go to the beach and, or, or just walk outside where you can find some sand and just pick up a handful, how many do you think are there? Hundreds? Thousands? What if I used to get a bucket? What if I were to get a bucket? How about if I get a 55-gallon barrel full of sand? How many grains of sand do you think are in there? Millions? How long would it take you to count that? Every grain of sand. Now, I want you to think of all the sand I just said. Psalm 139 said, Your thoughts cannot even be numbered. And now you understand when the psalmist said, Your thoughts about me, O Lord, are greater than the grains of sand of the earth. That's how much God thinks about you. And that's not just a metaphor. That's not some great example so you feel all warm and fuzzy inside. It's a literal thing that God never stops thinking about you. When did God start loving you? I, I heard some mumbling. I had to hear an air answer. Before you were created, before the world was born, before the foundation of the world. That's a good one. The Bible says that Jesus is the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. That means that before God even thought about the world, before anything that the world is formed in or from, that Jesus, it was the plan of God that he would die for you in your sin. Now that's hard for us to gather and, and, and understand, isn't it? But can you imagine that God loves you? And people, people wonder about, well, when does life start? And, you know, we, we want to argue about heartbeats and abortion. Look, the psalmist said, you formed me in my mother's womb and you wove me together. He told the prophet uh, Sam, uh, 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 Jeremiah, before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you. And I ordained you to be a prophet. Now that's a whole other message too, by the way. But that's real. And that's how much God loves you. That's how much God loves you individually. 1 John 4.19 says we love Him because He first loved us. God loves us with a great passion, and His love is relentless and persistent. It's unstoppable, never-ending, and it pursues us since the day we were born. I want to tell you that God has thought about you before you were made, then He made you, and when you were born, God has pursued you ever since, and He will pursue you until your last breath on this planet.
John 15, verse 9, Jesus said this to his disciples. As the Father has loved me, I also have loved you. And I want you to abide and remain, live, exist in my love. The Apostle Paul wrote in, eight, in Romans 8, 38 and 39, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nothing high, nothing in no deep, no, no depth, nor anything created shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Listen, that pretty much covers everything. So what he said is, I'm absolutely convinced that there is nothing that can separate us from God's love. <laughs> I don't know if I gave you this one, Melanie, but Ephesians 3, 18 and 19 says this. I hope that you, oh, I, there it is, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and the length and the height and the depth to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled to all the fullness of God. See, here's the thing. Paul's writing to the Ephesian church and to us as well, and he's saying, I hope you understand this because this is what's really going on. So I just want to emphasize to you today something that I was saying earlier to you about God wanting you to be free and God wanting you to live in Him and all the goodness He has for you. I hope you grasp a hold of that because it's not real when you understand it. It's real right now even when you don't understand it. But it becomes so much more real because you begin to enjoy it and live in it and walk in it and relish it and then you can give it when you understand how much He loves you. Nobody can love you greater than God can love you. I want you to think about the person that you know loves you more than anything in the world. The person that you know would go to the jumping off place with you and jump off. That would fight anything and everyone for you. And I want you to think about how good it makes you feel to know that that person loves you. And then I want you to multiply that by like a bazillion. Is that a real number, Kelly? No. I, that's, a, that's a Pastor John word. Bazillion. Quintillion. My brother used to say quintillion. Is that a real word? Quintillion? No. She's a mathematician, so I'm asking her. Listen, God loves you to infinity. And beyond. Right? Some of y'all got that. Some of y'all didn't. Exactly. Here's number three. True love. And who did I say, who did I say true love is? True love gives. And so if true love gives, and those of us who are in true love and want to be true love and have to live true love, we need to say it again like you believe it. Thank you. We don't want to say that word to a preacher because you're going to ask us for money. I ain't asked you for a dime and ain't going to ask you for a dime. That don't mean I don't believe in stewardship. That doesn't mean I don't believe in tithing or offerings. I do. But this goes way beyond your dollar bill. But I'll say this to you. That even especially your dollar bill, you're never more like God than when you give. That's a fact. For God so loved the world that He... Jesus loved us to the point that He gave His very life. 
we had a discussion the other day, me and Lori and a few people, we were talking about giving. We were talking about people who say they give and people who, say, who don't give and people who make up excuses why they don't give and all this stuff. And you know, when you look at really the essence of it, people don't even believe what they claim to believe, Right? You believe that, Pastor? I, I've, I've heard people say, well, Pastor, I don't, I don't believe that you have to just tithe money. I tithe time. I say, okay, well, let me see. Can you write down for me the things you've done for God this week? Can you write down for me how you served God and others in the church or, or maybe just in the community or, or charity or, or the homeless or, or, or orphans or widows? Can you just write down the things you've done for God this week, how you've given Him some time? Well, I, I don't keep up with it like that. You know what that means? I don't do it. It's been a while. I just say that I do it. Then I've heard people say stuff like, well, I give cash because I don't want anybody tracking what I give. Well, let me just tell you this, and I know this is ugly, but can I just be honest about it? Just say this because I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it anyways. Uh, one of the things that the pastor has privilege to is, is how much is given and who gives it. And even when you don't give so we can track it, I know how much is in there and I realize that there wasn't that much cash in there. So I just give cash. You putting a dollar in there is not stewardship. That's a tip and it's a weak one at that. We don't call that a tithe. We just call that a tip. And, that's, and some of y'all give more tips to your, to your waitress and your waiter than you do God. Oh! Y'all start ducking and it's okay. It's the truth, right? I'm saying, I was talking to a guy one time. I won't say where and I won't say who because I don't want you to know. It wasn't here though, I'll say that. It was in a whole other city. I was talking to a guy who I heard him testify one day. He said, I want to praise God for all that he's brought me through, and I started with nothing, and now I have a net value of $13.2 million. And I was a member of the same church he was a member of. I was on staff at that church. So that means, what does that mean? I knew the finances. So I said, because I cared about this brother, and I loved him, and I wanted to see him blessed in all the areas of his life. And if he thinks he's blessed now with his 13.2 million net profit or worth, how much more would he be blessed if he was really a good steward? Right? Right? I mean, honestly, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. In fact, listen, Malachi asked this question. Malachi says this, you've robbed God. And how have you robbed God? With your tithes and offerings. And can I tell you something? That's not just talking about you stole money belonging to God. What you stole mostly is God's ability to bless you. And God's opportunity to pour out on you blessing because you disqualified yourself because you didn't submit that to God. Is that okay? It's okay. It is okay. Do like this. Why are you talking about money, preacher? You said you weren't going to focus on money. I'm just focusing on money for a second because it makes you uncomfortable. Because it's so important to you. Us, all of us. Because to be alive, we got to have it. Or be self sustained you know, Any of y'all live on your own property, grow your own food, and, and, and farm your own animals and that kind of stuff? You don't need a grocery store or a job? Okay, all the rest of y'all need to pay attention when it comes to money. So I told his brother, I said, listen, I'm going to do a little math. Me and you just do a little bit of math. I said, 13.2 million that's net worth. That means after taxes and all that stuff, right? Is that what net gross means before? Net means this is how much I'm worth after I pay all my expenses. In. Net. So, bro, 
I ain't seen that money in the offering. He said, well, I don't give so people can track it because I don't want to take credit for it. I said, I think I would have noticed that cash come through. <laughs> it's kind of hard to miss $1.3 million. I ain't never seen that much, but I believe I could recognize it if I did. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I ain't never seen a giant either, but I believe I could recognize one if I saw it. <laughs> Let me ask you what's more important. All the money you have or the life of Jesus? God paid for you with his own son. That's how much he loves you. That's what he gave for you. Jesus. Romans 5, 5 says this, Now hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has poured out in our hearts the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So not only did God give you Jesus, but when Jesus had to go back to heaven, he gave you the Holy Spirit. And all the gifts. And all the fruit, and all the joy, and all the power, and everything that God has, He made available to you. How amazing is that? That's how giving He is. John 13, 34 and 35 says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. God's kind of love even enables us to do things that are impossible, to love people that you never thought you could love. You know, we just, I don't mean to pick on you, sister, I'm not, but your situation just reminds me of a very good thing. We just had ministries here this Wednesday and a couple of weeks ago called Families to Families or Families for Families. And it's about families. It's about caring for families and loving families who are foster families. And we would love to help you, by the way, in any way possible. And we have foster families who are part of our church. And the Bible tells us that the greatest and truest religion is that you love the orphans and the widows. And you say, well, they're not really orphans. Listen, if they don't have a mom or a daddy for whatever reason, it's an orphan. Lori and I worked three years at the Home for Children. I saw them come and go all the time. One time in three years did we really have a true orphan, but they were all orphaned. People say... You've probably heard this question before, sister. I know I had it. When I was at the Home for Children, people asked me, how could you put yourself in that situation? We hear people sometime in our church say, how can so-and-so do that? Why are they doing this? Why, how can you foster and do these things? It's because God puts this love in your heart, and you can do things that seem outside. You, look, you ask yourself the question, you think, there's no way I can do that. But when God does it and you realize how much he loves you and he puts that love in your heart, you are able to do things that you think are impossible. And that's just one good example. Luke 6, 27, I'm going to go to 32 and then also 38 of that same chapter. Jesus said this, But I say to you who hear me, love your enemies and do good to those who hate you. How can you do that? Only by the love of God. 32 says this, but if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. It's easy for you to love somebody that loves you, right? It's not easy for you to love people who hate you. It's not easy for you to love people, not just because you know they did wrong, while they're doing wrong. Do you realize that Jesus hung on the cross and loved the people that were killing him. Killing him. He said, God, forgive them. They don't even know what they're doing. While they were killing him, he was loving them. And loving us in the process. Now see, when I was a little boy, 
I used to like girls, um, and I still do, by the way. <laughs> just one, though. Just one. I, when I, I used to like all girls back then. I didn't care what girl I liked. I never picked out a girl and says, I like this girl. Like when I'm talking about when I was like fourth or fifth grade. Now, when I got to be a teenager, I was, you know, it was, I was a little more picky. Just a little. But it used to be, I would like girls, and, and, and whoever became my girlfriend, I remember fourth or fifth grade, whoever became my girlfriend, and maybe some of you guys are man enough to admit this now all these years later, but the only way I would ask a girl to be my girlfriend, we, back then we used to call going with me, right? Will you go with me? What do y'all call it now, right? Who, who knows? Nobody, none of y'all know? That makes sense. The, Y'all, my, my son one time, he'd come to me. He was like eight years old. He said, Dad, guess who I'm dating? I said, nobody. Because <laughs> you ate. <laughs> Even if you thought you had a girlfriend, you ain't dating nobody. I remember one time my cousin asked this girl, funny thing, I just mentioned the stuff that comes to your brain. He said, hey, will you go with me? She said, go where? He said, forget it. <laughs> The only time I asked a girl to be my girlfriend is if somebody told me ahead of time that she liked me. Right? Anybody, anybody man enough or woman enough to say you admit that? Hey, psst, so-and-so likes you. Ooh, really? <laughs> okay. I didn't say she was pretty. It didn't, she didn't have to be, you know, big or skinny or tall or short or, you know, have this kind of hair. All she had to be was alive. And like me. You know what I'm saying? She liked me. That was the qualification. She likes me. That means I'm not going to get rejected and hurt. Now, that's a funny thing. It's, but it's true. And some of you guys and girls understand that because we don't like being rejected. We don't like being hurt. And when we put ourselves out there enough to know, hey, I like you. And they say no, it hurts. Now, you just think of that for a second, and then you just kind of multiply that silly little feeling about fourth grade boyfriend and girlfriend love and realize that Jesus has called us to love people while they are hating us, not just rejecting us. Are you following me? Let me give you the last one. I'm going to skip down. True love grows, number four. True love grows. God loves us, and God's love in us has potential to keep us growing every single day. And so what I want to tell you is this. If you struggle with this love now, if you're struggling with loving people who hate you or some, somebody who's hurt you or forgiving people or, or, or giving or surrendering or anything that we've talked about today, you just keep at it. You just stay in God's love because, well, listen, God's love will help you grow. First, Thess First Thessalonians 3 and 12 says this, And may the Lord make you increase. Everybody say increase. May the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all, just as we do to you. So the apostle is telling us that God's love and God himself is able to increase the love in you if you don't give up, if you don't quit. Galatians 5, and 23, but the fruit of the Spirit is this, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. The fruit of the Spirit, those... Can I just meddle for a second? I'm going to come over here, Kelly. I've been walking over there all day long. I'm coming right over here. Not because you need this, but because I've been over there all day. I'm going to look this way because they're the ones that need this, okay? <laughs> and Clay, too. I'm not going to fit you. Thank you, Clay, for going back there. Here's the truth. Nothing irks me more. Us, I'm a Pentecostal pastor to my bones. You hear me? 
I believe in the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I believe in the power of the Spirit of God. I believe in the gifts of the Spirit. But I want to see more in my people than the gift of the Spirit. The first thing I want to see, the thing I need to see the most, what I desire for you more than prophecy is that you have the fruit of the Spirit in your life. Now that doesn't mean I don't want you to have the power of the Spirit in your life. I want you to have all the Spirit in your life. But do you know when the Spirit shows up, He brings everything He is and not just some of it. And some of the meanest folks I've ever met in my life is, is little folks who claim to be baptized with the Holy Ghost. Please don't come prophesy to me if you ugly to your family. Please don't come tell me God's given you a word when all the words you've given to your husband or your wife or your children is vile and vulgar and hateful. Because I don't want to hear it. And God don't either. And it ain't real. And yeah, I said it. Because if you got the fruit of the Spirit, if you got the gifts of the Spirit, that means you got the Spirit Himself, and His fruit is this. The very first one says love. So you might be struggling with it, and you might be having a hard time with somebody, but you can't be the devil claiming to be prophesying for God. Come on, somebody. Love. And I ain't talking about fish love. I'm talking about real love. I love these shoes. I love this bubble gum. Right? I love that show. That show's so funny. I hope you love me more than a show. And I've seen the way some of y'all take care of your shoes. Or your car, or whatever it else it is. Stop saying you love stuff that don't really know how to receive love. And love people. Let's start there. Let's love people. And especially the people that don't understand love and need love. And the ones that don't love us first. It's easy to love somebody that loves you back. But Jesus said, by your love for one another, will you people know that you're my disciple. When you love them, they go, why are you doing this? Why would you do this? Why are you acting this way for me? What is it about you? And then you're able to show them the love of Christ. A lot of people don't want to hear what you say about Jesus. Because you're not really living like you have him in your life. I know that's tough, but it's real. Love. Amen? Amen? Love. Can you bow your heads and pray with me, please? Father, I just thank you so much for your word. I thank you for the, the anointing that you've given us today, Lord, to hear, to preach, and receive the word of God. And Lord, I thank you that you are dealing with all of our hearts individually, Lord. And I pray that you would break up the hardness of where we are and who we are. And you let the seed of the Word of God be planted deep inside of us. And it would change us, God, forevermore. Renew our mind, change our thinking. And by that, you'll change our acting and our walking, our living, our being, and our talking. Help us to be your love in this world, Lord. More than anything else... And God, I do desire to see miracles. I do desire to see deliverance. I do desire to see healing. I do desire to see salvation. I desire to see all the things that you bring by the Spirit. But Lord, help us be the church that people say that church loves. Break our heart, Lord. As the song we sang this morning, break our heart for what breaks yours and who breaks yours. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you. I love you. You're dismissed in the name of the Lord.